So then let's think about point eight two structural change. It turns out that this is really, and that will become more obvious, a functional form specification. Specification. So I've already very briefly talked about that at the end of the last lecture, and we said that the relationships between variables may change, and they, for time series data, they will often change as a result of some event. Okay, and that could be, for instance, the introduction of the euro or a financial crisis, something that changes something fundamental in how economic variables are related to each other. For cross-sectional data, we are more thinking about differences, differences due to observations belonging to different groups. Observations belonging to different groups. So that may be. Um, male and female, so maybe gender groups in, uh, in medicine, that often means you're in sort of randomized trial, are you treated or not? Treated or not? Okay, all sorts of different groups you could think about, employed or unemployed, all sorts of stuff. Now the following example we're going to use. So here's the example. Let's assume we have time series data. You can you can get them from the lecture data spreadsheet. Okay, and try this yourself. And we are thinking of a relationship between savings at time t. That's uh, U.S. data. That's macro data. Savings and disposable income. Clearly, we would expect that to be some sort of positive relationship, the sort of a very Keynesian theory of uh, savings. Now, let us look at the data. Remember, a simple plot can tell a lot. Here, you go. Here are the time series plots of the of the data of income on the left hand panel and savings on the right hand panel. And if you were in the lecture, I would ask now, can you see, is there anything interesting you can see here? The income series seems to be decidedly uninteresting. It's just going steadily up. Oh, we know this is, you know, a quite common feature. Uh, income just goes up. Savings in the first part of the sample seems to go, seems to be going up fairly steadily as well, although we have a couple of dips here. But then somewhere here, I was having crooked line. Somewhere here something changes. There's a lot of variation. All of a sudden we get a lot of variation and the sort of clear upwards trend which we see here has disappeared. Perhaps there's still a sort of trend but you know it's certainly weaker and there's more variation around it. So clearly there has something changed certainly in the saving series that doesn't see find an equivalent change in the income series. So that means that the relationship between savings and disposable income, which is here described by our two coefficients, alpha and beta, may not be the, the same throughout the entire sample. So there's some sort of qualitative change here. Qualitative change in the properties of the saving series. Now that doesn't necessarily imply that alpha and beta will change, but it allows or it makes it obvious that there's a question, do alpha and beta change then? Change as well. And that is now the question we're going to ask. Whenever we estimate a model like this, like in 159, we assume that these coefficients these guys are 
assumed to be constant throughout the sample. And this is now the question we're gonna we're gonna check. So it turns out that if you perform a reset test, what we talked about in the in the previous section, if you perform a reset test on this relationship, on this data, find a p-value of 0.003. That clearly indicates that there is a problem. Now, that could be something, uh, some omitted variable, it turns out it, it is an omitted variable, but it is because of this structural change. So could it be that the relationship changed after 81? Okay, that's, uh, okay, 81. This is where we have potentially the change. This is the question we're gonna tackle now. So we will perform what is called a, so we want to test for structural change. And this test we're gonna do is called the Chow test. It's a very, very famous test. So, and the idea of the Chow test is as follows. So the idea. So firstly, think of let's say, blue is the full sample. What we have here are the predicted, the observations that are. I should indicate this. This guy, these are, this is saving at time t. Remember what our model looks like. We're modeling saving as a function of disposable income. So we have saving here on the axis. The solid line is the savings and the uh, this line here the one which goes through, that is saving time t predicted from the full sample. Okay, and uh, try to, to blend out the, the others. So as you can see, this sort of fits these data sort of all right. It, you know, it follows that trend. Now there's of course, there's another question you should ask and in, in that sense, and this is actually not a good example. Um, should we be using data like this in a regression? The answer is clearly no. Um, it's a bad example with what we know already, but it still serves well to illustrate what's going on here with the Chow test. So this is the predicted value and that fits the data somehow. The diff remember the differences between saving t and the predicted value are the residuals. Now also imagine that you estimate the model for the two subsamples. So the first one is from 1970 to 1981 and the second subsample is from 1980 to 1995 and the predicted values we get for this are these green ones okay so these are the predicted values for t from the first subsample and these guys are the predicted values for t from the second subsample and here these were the full sample. So now the question is which one fits better? Which fits better? Green? Aha, that was blue. 
So blue the full sample or using the subsamples. Now you can possibly already tell by being able to fit subsamples we actually do fit the data somewhat better. Okay, This should be quite obvious here where we get sort of different trends in these predicted savings whereas when we uh, use the full sample we get a more or less constant trend which you already said where we didn't really observe. So which one fits better? Now we can eyeball this but really what we want is we want a formal test to test for this uh, for this guy. But the basic idea is the same. Okay, We will basically have two, re two sets of regressions. We regress our model on full sample, we regress it on the subsamples and then we compare the fit. And this is what we then call the chow test. So let me put this here. Okay, so we basically we will regress on full and subsamples. and compare the fit. Compare the fit. Now we will use in the end an F-test as you can already see. Now you know in an F-test we need a restricted and an unrestricted version. Now which of these two, what did we say, actually the um, full was blue. Let me continue to use advanced teaching techniques and use color. So regress on the full sample and on the subsample. That was green. Now, which of these two will be the restricted version, and which one will be the unrestricted? Well, the full estimating on the full restricts the coefficients to be the same. So this is going to be the restricted model. Whereas using the subsamples, subsamples will be the unrestricted because that will allow the coefficients to change. So this will be now reflected in our uh, F-test. Now recall the F-test, what we basically need is we need residual sum of squares from a restricted model and residual sum of squares from an unrestricted model. And we need to know how many restrictions we are testing. And we need to know what the degrees of freedom in the unrestricted model is. Now here, t is our sample size. t is the sample size. So. The restricted, we already said, that comes from the plu, from the full model. So we estimate the full model, the full on the full sample, and we get our residual sum of squares. That's easy. But how do we get it for the unrestricted? How do we get as SU? Okay, the unrestricted model. How do we how do we get that? Now the unrestricted we said is estimating in the two subsamples and we get a residual sum of squares from the first subsample and a residual sum of squares from the second subsample. And what we'll do is we'll just add these two because they don't have overlapping observations. These two subsamples cover all the observations that are also covered in the full sample. So we just add the two residual sum of squares and what we get is the residual sum of squares unrestricted. And that is then used in here. So that means we're happy if we have our RSSU, we have the RSSR and the RSSU, we need k and t minus 2k. Okay. Well, let's k first, let's do this first. We said this is the number of restrictions. In general, I said every tef F test, this will be the number of restrictions. Now. Usually we can get this by counting parameters. So how many, let's start, how many parameters do we have in the restricted model? Restricted model. 
we are estimating alpha and beta having two parameters. What about the unrestricted model? How many parameters have we got there? Well we are estimating alpha and beta for the first subsample that's two and we will be estimating alpha and beta for the second subsample and they will be allowed to be different. It means altogether we have four. So in the unrestricted model we have four coefficients in the restricted model we have two that means we have 4 minus 2 equals 2 restrictions. Okay, so how do you get these restrictions? You compare the number of coefficients estimated in the unrestricted model and subtract the number of coefficients in the restricted model. For this guy here, the divisor in the denominator, we said these are always the degrees of freedom in the unrestricted model for all f-tests. So how many degrees of freedom do we have? The unrestricted model we're estimating for t observations, we're estimating something for all observations even in although we do that in two batches and how many coefficients do we estimate? Well we already know that, four. Okay four coefficients we're estimating. So t minus 4 is going to be our decrease of freedom. Now as you can see here k in this little form we said that k was equal to 2. That was the number of coefficients in model 160. And the Chow test you can then, if you know what k is, you can always calculate these degrees of freedom parameters here in this way. k in the numerator and t minus 2k in the denominator. But you will always get the correct result as well if you use our rules which you introduced, number of restrictions and degrees of freedom of the unrestricted model. That will always give you the same and correct result. So two ways of going about it, two ways which give you the right solution. So what are the hypotheses we are testing? H0 is going to be that the two RSSU and RSSR are basically the same and that means that there is no difference between the fit in the full sample in the full and the subsamples. Samples. Okay, and the alternative hypothesis is the complement of that, that is there is a difference. And if there is a difference, there will only be a difference if the alpha and the beta differ between these subsamples. So only if there is a structural change, so if the coefficients that describe the relationship between disposable income and saving if they change, then this test will reject the null hypothesis. So let's do this for our example, for the data. I'll give you all the results, but you can replicate, you can replicate all, of it, all of this. Actually, I should say, I, I mentioned earlier, this was sort of a bad example turns out that this is potentially one of the examples where it is justified, the special cases where it is justified to, uh, to use these non-stationary data. This may potentially be what we call a co-integrated relationship and then you can do it, but um, that really goes beyond our course. So let's just go back to the application here. 
here I provide you with the residual sum of squares for the uh, subsamples here and here that will give us the unrestricted so if we add these two we will get this value and we know the restricted residual sum of squares and of course that guy RSSR as always RSSR has to be larger than RSSU if you don't get that you've made a mistake then we know that K equals to 2 so we have 2 our D, so we know our F test statistic is distributed as an F distribution with 2 and T minus 2K how many years have we got 70 to 95 that's 26 years so T minus 4 is going to be 22 so that one here is going to be 26 minus 4 it's going to be 22 so this is where our this is the distribution where our critical value comes from you can check that 5.72 actually let's do that I got this critical value by using for instance Excel or possibly MATLAB to get an exact critical value what could you find in the exam this is the F table you will get and uh, we said did we say something about the significance level oh yeah one percent at one percent we have two degrees of freedom we had 22 2 and 22 degrees of freedom so you possibly in the exam you would have chosen the closest to 22 that's 20 you would have chosen 5.85 for one percent or for five percent 3.49 and as you can see these values are very close to the values which are given here but they are exact for 22 degrees of freedom in the exam you couldn't have gotten these you could have gotten the ones from the table so if you plug all these values into your F formula here what you get is this this value 10.69 our decision rule important for the F test for this test decision rule is it's a right side of test reject H naught if F is larger than the critical value. So here we have 10.69 even at a 1% level. So let's say we set alpha to 1% and that means that we reject H naught as our test statistic 10.69 is actually is indeed larger than the critical value. So this is how our child test works. Basic idea, it's important to understand. We're dividing our full sample into two subsamples. Here we use time series data, so we divide it in time. But if we had, we, we argued earlier, we may have cross-sectional data when uh, the differences are in terms of different groups, then we would divide our sample into different groups. We would estimate a regression for males and another one for females, for instance. And we estimate our model for the full sample, we chuck everything together. From these estimations we get a restricted residual sum of squares and an unrestricted and then we use a standard F-test to test our null hypothesis. This is what the child test is. There's a number of additional notes I want to... smaller I don't think so so I'll just um, I'll just copy that over here you've seen this you can break this so I'll just put them here a number of additional notes I need to talk to you about about the F test firstly this distribution is only valid if the if we basically don't have heteroscedasticity okay if the error variance in the two subsamples is identical. So basically we are saying we have homoscedastic error terms. If we reject H naught 
Remember in our example we estimated two coefficients, but it could be more coefficients clearly in that regression model. What we do not know is which of these coefficient changes. It may be both coefficients that change between the subsamples, but it may be one of the coefficients only. Okay? To address that issue we'll use dummy variables and that's going to be in the next section, Okay, section 8.3. Secondly, we assumed that we know the time of the break. Okay, we said here it was, I think, was it 1981? Okay, after 1981. But what do we do if we do not have, if we do not know exactly when the structural break takes place? What we then need is some sort of what's called a recursive strategy. So in your test, you not only want to check is there a test, but also, so you want to know is, sorry, is there a break? And if so, when? Okay, we are basically asking an additional uh, question. And lastly, we also need to know that there's one break only. Okay, but basically, the, the extension to more than one breaks is quite simple. Okay, basically, you just get your unrestricted, for instance, if you have two breaks, you have. To three subsamples and then RSSU is going to be equal to RSS1 plus RSS2 plus RSS3 and you need to adjust uh, your uh, degrees of freedom according to the general rule okay the rules we had here and then everything will be fine to address this point here, this has been solved in the literature. Okay, uh, it's often called the Andrews test, but we don't deal with this. There is a recursive procedure; it makes life a little bit more difficult. But hey, I said this we're going to solve now, and this one is solved as well, but we just don't deal with it.